it's, uh, it's time for our Bible reading. As you can see, the passage is on the screen. We're finishing off 1 Corinthians tonight, uh, if Ian gets through his sermon completely. Um, so we're looking at chapter 16, verses 13 to 24. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Do everything in love. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the servants' service of the saints. I urge you, brothers, to submit to such as these and to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you, for they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Achilla and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers here send you greetings. Greet each, greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. Come, O Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Keith Green. Now, I didn't know who Keith Green was. I had no idea. I mean, surprisingly, I had no idea. I only came to know him or know about him a little later in my life, ironically, quite a lot later than back then. Does anyone know who Keith Green is? Yeah, and most of the older hands go up. A few younger ones, so that's encouraging. Keith Green was a, by his own account, a rebellious young man who had no interest in God and who was uh, a singer, a gifted 
singer, a gifted songwriter, uh, who was writing songs way back then and singing at nightclubs and going around to different places doing different gigs. And then he began to start seeking after, in inverted commas, God. And he went to Buddhism and Hinduism, a whole, a whole lot of others, and eventually, in kind of as a last resort, decided he would walk into a church. You never know. You never know what might happen. You never know who might walk through these doors. And he walked into a church and was overwhelmed by a sense of God's presence in that church. And as a result of that, as a result of the movement of the Holy Spirit, God converted. It had an immediate effect upon his life. There were changes that immediately began to happen in his life. He began to write Christian music. He began to sing his music. And then after he became known within the Christian community, he offered his music free. You tell me what artist does that. So that you could take his, back then, tapes. He would leave them out and you could help yourself to them, no charge. Um, and he felt convicted of God to operate like that. I remember coming to Australia in 98 and, and uh, a little bit later, in fact, about five years later, meeting someone who was involved in the Christian music business. And he said to me, Ian, I still get requests for Keith Green's music, even though he died some 25 years ago. And when you hear his music, he was only recorded once live. He never wanted to be recorded because for him it wasn't, it wasn't a show. It wasn't about drawing attention to himself. And the amazing thing is someone unknown to him recorded him playing in his very last concert. And as you see the camera focusing on me, he sat at a piano, I get goosebumps when I, when I think about it. You, you, you see a man who is worshipping God and there just happens to be a crowd there. It's as if Keith Green is, is so caught up in his worship that Everyone out there kind of just fades away, and it's as if they're not present, because he's so caught up in his devotion, in his relationship to God. It wasn't long after that that he took off in a plane with th three of his children, and that plane crashed, and they were all killed, including the pilot, 28 years old. We sing one of his songs. Um, well, written by his wife, Melody, actually. Keith Green had 28 years on this world and even less as a Christian. This tiny amount of time to shine for Jesus, to live for Jesus, to devote his life to Jesus. None of us know when the Lord may knock on the door and say, it's time. You just don't know. I had a friend at school who was 18 who died, who was a Christian, when he did his national service. And so while some of you may be younger tonight and think, you know, I've got my whole life ahead of me, and I really mean this when I say, God forbid that anything happens to you for you not to enjoy a full life. I've been a pastor long enough to know that that doesn't always work out like that. We are given a, a, a limited period on, time, uh, on earth in this world. No one knows how long that limited period is. And so we only have so many years by which we can serve God and we can uh, try and ensure that our lives count for something. That we are driven by the purposes of God. That we are driven by our devotion to God. That we are building up treasure in heaven rather than building up treasure in this world which moths come in and, and which decay and rust comes in. You've just got this short amount of time to serve God with all your strength, with all your heart, 
with all your life. And when you begin to get older, for some of those here this evening who are not my age, you will realize how quickly that time goes. And if you don't believe me, if you go and speak to an older person and ask them how quickly the years have passed. And so while we are here in this world, we need to live a life that is worth living, a life that counts for God, a life that is going to make a difference in this world. As we dedicate ourselves, as we commit ourselves to God, as we serve Him, For as long as he gives us breath. The Apostle Paul comes to Christ later in life. We don't know how old the Apostle Paul was when he came to Christ. Neither do we know how old he was when he died. But he certainly did not have as many years as I have had to serve God in this world. But when you look at the effect that Paul's life had upon the world... And its effect, it's still having upon the world. And then when you think about Jesus, whose ministry lasted for three years, you realize that for those who are fully devoted to God, you can make a significant difference in this world. So use your time wisely. And the Apostle Paul, I think in these first two verses, gives us a little bit of taste and then in the verses following, of what that looks like in the Christian life. So firstly, and we're only going to do one point this evening, and there are a number of headings under that. I want you to notice the importance of vigorous faith. I've chosen my words carefully. The importance of vigorous faith. It's too easy to allow our faith to kind of become passive in this world. But the Apostle Paul would want to yell out to us in our ears, you don't have time to be a passive Christian. There needs to be vigor to your faith. You need to be a Christian who's out there exercising your faith, living it out. What does that look like? Number one, it is alert, verse 13a. It is alert. Look what he says. Be on your guard. Be on your guard. Now, the apostle is literally saying to them, as a Christian, you need to be in constant readiness. These commands that follow in verses 13 and 14 are all in the imperative mood. The imperative is a command. They are in the present tense. Now, in Greek, the tenses work differently to English. Now, I've explained this once before, but for those of you who haven't heard the explanation, let me just briefly explain the difference. In the present tense, we say things that are present. I am preaching now in the present. That's present tense. And so it's concerned with time. Past tense is time. Future tense is what's going to happen in the future. It's time-related. In the Greek language, tense is concerned with action, what action is occurring. And the present tense conveys ongoing action. It is continual action. So in effect, in the imperative mood, what Paul is saying is, be on your guard always. Keep being on your guard. Keep being alert. Keep watching out for your faith. In what sense should we be on our guard? Well, we are to guard against Satan, who is the great schemer in this world, who seeks to trip us up spiritually, who would seek to lead us down wrong paths, who would seek to cause our faith to become passive, who would whisper in our ear and say, see what an ineffective Christian you are. You hardly got any gifts. Don't worry about not serving God. Or you're too busy and distract us from service because we get so caught up in the busyness of life that we forget to serve God because our busyness overwhelms us. He prowls around. He comes to you in the form of a sheep. He puts on sheep's clothing so that when he comes, you may be un, uh, not ready for the attack that comes because he seeks to deceive us. 
He seeks to lead us astray. He seeks us to lead us in paths that are not consistent with God. And so, 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Peter writes, Be self-controlled and alert. There's that word. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. Because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Are you on guard? Are you always alert? Are you ready for the attacks of Satan? Or are you a passive Christianity who's asleep on the job? They must guard, you must guard against temptations by putting the right armor in place. And so Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 6, and he says, put on the armor of God so that you go out into the world armed because you are engaged in a fierce spiritual battle, which so often we underestimate. Be on your guard. Luke 22, verses 40 to 46, Jesus says to his disciples, 40 and 46, to pray. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Verse 46, why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. How much prayer is in, are you engaged in throughout the day in your life so that when temptation does knock at your door, you are alert, you are ready, you're on guard, you recognize it, and you repel it by resisting Satan. The next problem is that of spiritual coldness. When things don't go always the way that you and I want them to go, the pitfall of becoming spiritually cold is always present. Perhaps we're frustrated in some prayer that God has not answered. Perhaps we become disillusioned because we've been involved in a situation where another Christian has said some horrible things to us, and we are down in the dumps. Perhaps through just slackness in our Christian life, we've allowed our devotions to slip. And once when we first came to faith, where there was this fire in our belly, where we were on fire for God, spiritual coldness has descended into the depths of our soul. And the love for Jesus has become cold. And we've lost our first love. Remember 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. Let me read the verses. When Elijah gets up in front of the people of Israel who have been languishing in spiritual apathy year after year after year, serving the bowls, serving Asherah, and he confronts him on Mount Carmel, and he makes these words, he says these words, how long will you waver between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. You see that passivity? You see that spiritual coldness? That when Elijah challenges them with the multitude that are gathered on Mount Carmel, all they can do is sit there and keep quiet. And only after God moves in fire, and the altar is burnt up, and the sacrifice is burnt up, do the people finally fall down before God and cry, Yahweh, Elohe, the Lord, He is God. Who's God in your life? Who's really God in your life? Is it entertainment? Is it your free time? Is it your marriage? Is it your children, your family? Is it your work? Are you battling with loyalties? Jesus says in Matthew 16, 6, verse 24, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, 
or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You have to make a choice. Joshua confronts the people at the end of Joshua and the book of Joshua when they're in the land and they've taken the land. And he says, choose whom this day you will serve. As for me and my household, we will serve Yahweh. Are you sitting here this evening perhaps with a heart that has become cold in your faith? Simply become going through the motions. And God is saying, I want you back. Come back. Come back. There's also an alertness against false teaching. In an age where there's a proliferation of false teaching, where all kinds of newfangled doctrines come out, particularly from America, where it's easy to get sucked in and drawn into these things that sound so great on the surface, we are to be alert. We are to guard against false doctrine. We are to resist it. We are to search the Scriptures. We are to assess everything against the backdrop of Scripture. The Bible is our point of reference. And whatever we hear and whatever we see and whatever is even preached from this pulpit should always be tested against the Word of God. Because it's God's Word that is important. And we must found and do everything based upon the principles that come out of God's Word. It is our only authority. I'm not your authority. I'm not. God is your authority. The Word of God speaks. And Peter warns us of this incredible danger. Listen to 1 Peter 2 verse 1. I did have a chair, but it's gone. And I checked all my references. It shows you I'm getting old. 1 Peter 2 verse 1 reads as follows. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Now here, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on them. And then notice what he says. You think, oh, it's not going to happen to me. But then listen what he says. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the truth into disrepute. So Peter is saying, even within the church, church broadly, not church narrowly, church worldwide, there will be false teachers and they will seek to introduce heresies. And you know what makes false teachers so dangerous? It's not the obvious. Everyone picks that. It's the subtle heresies that just twist the truth a little here and there. Take a verse out of context and put onto it a meaning that is not there when you put it in its context. Those are the real dangers that churches face. So remain vigilant. Do not get sucked into every passing fad, every wind of doctrine, so that you are tossed to and fro upon the sea like an infant. Don't allow that to happen. Secondly, it is firm. Verse 13b, it is firm. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. It is critical that believers know the word. Know what you believe. Be sure of your beliefs. Know the gospel. Make sure that when you present the gospel, that you present the entire gospel. Be, make sure you are grounded in the faith. Make sure that when those false things come, you can go back and say, but God's word says, be settled in your deep convictions. Make sure when it comes to the fundamentals of the faith that you are not 
swayed by arguments when the fundamentals of your faith are being brought into question. Do not allow yourself to get sucked into popularism. Just because something is believed by a whole lot of people doesn't make it true. You need to be sure that when it comes to the basic, the first things of importance that Paul talks about in the chapter 15 of this chapter, when he talks, talks about first important issues, your basics of the faith, who Jesus is, who God is, what the gospel is, what salvation is, what Christ has accomplished on the cross, what sin is, those core beliefs you know you know, and are not pulled left, right, and center by those who seek to undermine, uh, undermine the fundamentals of the faith. Yes, there's movement for secondary and tertiary issues. It may be that there are tweaks here and there that you will make over time as you read more and more and you understand more and more. But those core, those fundamental doctrines should never change. And you know, it's easy for us to speak about that now and here and to say, oh, I won't fall into that trap. All you need to do is read church history. Take a overview of church history and see how often the church has been led astray and how theologians have risen up and distorted the word of God and brought uncertainty within churches. People like the German theologian Schleiermacher, who denied the gospel, but was very popular. Or Karl Barth, another German, it must be German theologians, who believed in neo-orthodoxy. In other words, the word only becomes the word when it becomes the word for you personally. So if it doesn't become the word for you, it's not the word. Be careful. Know the truth and stand on the truth. Paul writes to the Galatians and he says, But even if we, listen to this, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Those are not my words. Hear that. And then he repeats it in verse 9. As we have already said, so now I say again. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Now, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to know that there are many false gospels being preached today around the world. Just tune into the hour of power. You need to ensure that you are firm in your beliefs. Let me read a few more. Titus 1 verse 9. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Titus 2.1. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. I don't know if any of you have read what happened to Billy Graham when he went to, I think it was Wheaton College he went to. I might be wrong in the college. Was it Wheaton? Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but he went to college in the USA, and he said, one night, because they he said it was being teaching stuff that began to bring question marks in my own mind about the truth of the gospel, and I was beginning to vacillate and wonder whether or not what is being taught was true, and whether or not what I believed was true, and so one night he withdrew in the college campus, and he said, I spent the whole night there wrestling with God about whether or not I could trust the Bible, whether or not I could trust the gospel. And at the end of that time, as the morning broke, 
Billy Graham came to the conclusion that he could trust the word and he would stand upon the word and the rest is history. So are you standing firm upon the word of God? Thirdly, it is courageous. Look at verse 13c. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. It's courageous. The person who wants to serve God and be faithful in their service of God will be someone who stands courageously for who God is and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And boy, do we not need courage in this age where we are living in an age of pluralism where everyone's right and no one's wrong and all religions lead to Rome. And you can't say things like, there is only one way to God. Because that's not politically correct. Because the moment you say there's only one way to God, you're excluding a whole lot of other people out there. And so even Christians now within the faith have begun to compromise at this point. And have begun to interact with interfaith, with people of different faiths. And have come to conclusions like, well, you know, maybe the Hindu uh, comes to God through Hinduism. But in fact, it's really Jesus Christ who is the one that's brought them to God. That's not biblical. And so, my dear friend, you are going to have to stand courageously for what you know to be true. And if you get attacked, and if you get mocked, and if you get ridiculed, and if you get labeled politically incorrect, it's more important that you have God's approval than you have the approval of men. Let me tell you, it requires courage to be a Christian in a pluralistic society. That's why Christians so often are hated. Because Christians say there's only one way to God and it's through Jesus Christ and we cannot compromise on that. And so they're accused of being bigots. They're accused of being discriminatory. They discriminate against all other religions. Whereas we prefer to say, no, this is what God's word says. Attack me as you might. Ridicule me as much as you want. Call me whatever name you want. But I will not go back. This is what God says. That requires courage. So Paul says, be courageous. Don't be intimidated. It is strong. Verse 13d. Be in your God. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Now that emphasis there is strength in God through physical, uh, through, through spiritual growth. That our faith is strengthened because we are not Christians who remain static in our faith. We are Christians who are moving forward in our faith. We are growing in our faith. And we are submitting in obedience to God as He begins to reveal more and more about Himself to us. And as our lives begin to be more and more adjusted in conformity to the image of Christ, so that as the revelation of God through the illumination of the Holy Spirit comes to us, and as God begins to fashion us, and as God begins to bring change and begins to move the furniture around in our house, And as our lives begin to to be modified according to what God is speaking to us through His Word, so we become stronger in our faith. Faith must never remain static. It can't remain static. Because God is in the process of the sanctification of the believer. And that requires that as we understand more about who God is and God begins to touch certain areas of our lives and he brings his flame to bear and he begins to burn away the dross. That we don't resist God's work by the Spirit, but we submit to it and we say, God, do your work. Because it matters that I become more and more like Jesus. And so we surrender ourselves 
to the work of the Holy Spirit. And we rely on the strength of God to propel us, to enable us to then go out and be minister. We minister in the strength of God. Because power doesn't come from ourselves, but comes from God who gives it generously. And so Paul writes to the Ephesians and he says, I pray out of his glorious riches, he may do what? He may strengthen you with power through his spirit and your inner being. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. Paul is praying that God's creatorial, that's the word that is used in the original, God's creatorial power by which he created this universe might strengthen you in your faith so that Christ, who is in you by the Spirit, would dwell more and more and more in your heart. In other words, it's a way of saying, that my life becomes more and more submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you submit more and more of yourself to his control, so the strength of God becomes more and more apparent and available in your life. Because now it's Jesus who's doing it and not us. And so Paul as he writes to the Philippians in chapter 4, verse 13, is able to write so confidently and say, I've known what it's like to have a lot. I've known what it's like to have nothing. I know what it's to be in want and to be in plenty. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you get it? Christ empowers him. Christ fuels him. Because Paul has surrendered his life to him. And then finally, it's loving. Look at verse 14. We could spend a whole sermon here. Look at verse 14. It's loving. Do everything, hear that, everything in love. Love is the foundation of the Christian service and life. We serve Jesus because we love Jesus. We serve each other because we love Jesus. We love each other because we love Jesus. And Jesus has spread his love into our hearts. And so Jesus says, uh, to his disciples, that they are to love each other. How? As I have loved you. Listen to the words of Jesus himself who makes that uh, statement. A new command I give to you. Love one another. John 13, 34. As I have loved you. And how has Jesus loved us? Is the question we should be asking. By giving his life for us, by sacrificing his life for us. And so, John 15, 13, Jesus says, Greater love has this than, uh, has no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friends, so that our love extends to be willing to make whatever sacrifices we need to make, not because we are desiring to make sacrifices or desiring to impress people through the sacrifices, but because we have grasped something of the depths of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf, who's taken away our sin. And when we understand what Jesus has done for us, we extend that to others. And we love them. We love them. And what are we told in 1 Peter 4 verse 8 about what that love looks like? Peter writes it like this. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. In other words, because we love one another, we give each other a wide berth. Christians should not be easily offended. You shouldn't. You shouldn't easily get upset with other Christians who do things that they shouldn't do to you because we recognize all of us are fallen. All of us are going to commit those things against each other. And love 
covers that. It's the umbrella that overarches all of that. John makes this startling pronouncement about how we love one another, and it is startling. In 1 John 3 verse 10, hear carefully. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. So John begins by saying, do you want to know what the difference is between those who serve the devil and those who serve Christ, those who love Jesus and those who love the world? Do you, not want to know what the, do you want to know what the difference is? I'll tell you. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. That's startling. John is saying, do you want to know what this distinguishing mark about Christians is? They love each other. They love each other. And that's how we know that they're Christians. This is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. And John is simply saying that if we are going to show to the world and to each other the genuineness of our Christianity, then whatever we do will be done because we love each other. Remember the words of Paul writing to the Ephesians in chapter 4, verse 29? Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is good for upbuilding others according to their needs so the church of God may be built up. When we speak to each other, is it framed in love? Do we speak in a way that builds others up or drags them down? When we think of the, our love expressed towards each other, do we love those that rub us up the wrong way? And we all have them, let's be honest. Do we avoid the difficult people? Or do we extend our loving arms to all? even those who are difficult? Do we love the unlovely? You know that, that prickly person that just always says the wrong thing or does the wrong thing? Forever putting their foot in their mouth. In fact, the only time they open their mouth is to exchange feet. Do we love them? Do we embrace them? Do we love the ones that don't love us back? That we reach out, we extend love to, and they push us away and say, I don't want it. Do we keep loving them? You can only do that, you see. This is why John says it's proof of the fact that you're a Christian. You can only do that if you're powered by God. There's no other way. It's God who strengthens us. It's God who enables us. It, it's God who gives us the ability to do that. How does Jesus look with love towards those who are crucifying him and say, Father, forgive them. I don't know what they're doing. How does Jesus look with love to the eyes of that rich young ruler who comes to him and, and says, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And, and Jesus says, go and sell your goods. And he walks away sad because he can't sell his good. And Jesus looks at him with love. And he loved him, it seems. Do we love like that? Do we love our enemies? Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We've not put in this word for a long time. Our time here is so brief. So we pray and plead and beg you that you would help us and strengthen us by the power that comes from Jesus for our lives to count. 
for our lives to make a difference for the glory of God. That we would be so submitted to you and have such a vigorous faith. That our faith as it is exercised in this world would have a marked effect upon all we come into contact with. So that at the end of the day, whenever you call us home, we will know that we have been spent for the glory of God. For Jesus' sake.